Hi, Lloyd. Howdy. How you doing? Doing good. Double dipping. Thank you for joining us, Bert. It's all good. Letia should be joining us in a second. I like your um, studio. <laughs> yeah, I, unfor I tried to get to work on my work computer, but uh, but my work com my work computer won't let me uh, download Zoom and uh, the browser um, the browser app doesn't work very well at all with. Uh, um, with uh with presenting so instead i am using my phone which is fine i've already troubleshot stuff for it how are things going up north a little chilly started my morning walk and did one lap came back in put more layers on and then finished it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's getting chilly down here too and there's a let yeah Howdy. I'm going to have a little mental dissonance going on here because I'm listening to a meeting on landing on the moon for work mm -hmm. and then I'm listening to you guys. Are you yeah. Sad? I mean. None of that. Hello, everyone. Let's see, we'll start in one more minute. I got you. Sorry, I'm going to 
disappear real quick, grab water, and be right back. Hopefully in less than a minute. Maybe less than 30 seconds. Here we go. Pee. All right, Leti, are you back yet? Yes. All right. So everybody, I'm going to just introduce this and then uh, Leti is gonna take off, take over, I should say. Uh, the purpose of this uh, Fabris luncheon is originally, was originally conceptualized by me to be uh, basically to kind of um, dispel the stereotype that Fabris is only a, you know, leaned over, uh, sort of extended that he really exists within that stereotype of kind of the, what a lot of fencers call kind of a goofy stance. Um, we are going to talk about that and I will go through the more conventional guards that, um, he teaches that are similar to Fabris and uh, similar to Capo Ferro and Giganti. But uh, um, Letty is also going to describe why Fabris does the lean forward stance as well. So I'm going to present the slide deck and Letty is going to uh, take over as the lead instructor for the first part of the class. So without further ado, we're going to do that. Oh, also, if you're not presenting, uh, please put, your, put uh, uh, your device on mute. So. All right. Um, so I'm going to get started. Um, first off, Fabris looks really weird compared to a lot of the other forms because of the massive bend over um, that Julian was just talking about the hip hinge. Um, but it's actually not that different from a balance and movement standpoint. Um, as he was saying, to a lot of Giganti and Capoferro and other Italian masters, once you find the balances and whatnot, and he even kind of seeks to that a little bit, and uh, we'll get more into that later. So um, it's already, fencing's already hard. It's already moving your arms and legs in different ways that need to match up and, um, you know, timed right in funky ways that we aren't meant to do in our normal modern society. Um, so some of these things are hard and almost impossible, at least to start, um, or possibly impossible overall. Um, he talks about how to keep the body, Fabris does, in his kind of introduction chapters, where he goes through a lot of the theory. And one of the things he says is the larger body is harder to defend, which means huzzah, all of us tiny people who are like 5'3", it's easier to defend our tiny selves. Um, but his bent over is trying to get your body behind the sword. It's trying to make yourself smaller. So some of us have an advantage, but that is the goal of it. And the amount you can do that gives you more or less advantage. But just like anything, it's a gradient. So if you are bent over so much to the point you can't actually move, it's not an advantage. He actually speaks to that when he goes through, well, before that, he has to throw some shade because we are talking Italian masters, right? So he's like, um, I agree that some claims are true about holding the body upright as a preferred method, but that are so, um, but that some, uh, I didn't write the full quote because my notes aren't great. Uh, but basically it's like, that is some of the time, but not, not always. And some are right for some reasons but not always, because as I said, he has to throw shade. Uh, he has to smack, smack talk as the rest of the contemporary masters of the time, um, just like all of them do. Um, he also goes on uh, further in the how to hold your body chapter um, to, if you know how to carry your body forward properly and without awkwardness, you will be better served to bend it. But if you think you cannot, you should remain straight because if you force your posture, you will not be ready to move. So he clearly makes a 
plea or a um a fact maybe not fact whatever word we're looking for here he clearly makes a statement that if you are risking movement for this bend we're doing that that is wrong you are failing yourself so the bend is ideal but it's not necessarily necessary um, to do fabris you should be able to move before you are bending awkwardly um he goes on um that because he gives some less proper guards in his first part with sword and dagger where he's introduced or with sword sorry not sword and dagger but with sword he gives some less proper guards which he kind of tears apart he's like oh this is bad for this reason and this reason and this reason but he also goes on within those he'll say things like while that guard is less fatiguing this one's better but because he mentions how that fatiguing guard is like it's better to be able to move um we can take that to be these are kind of alternates until you can get some of these better better proper guards um so before we look at the plates of saying that just keep in mind the he's clearly states it's better to move than to be bent um, so the first guard, which we have on screen now, um, the proper first guard um, that he shows, this is his, his first guard where he kind of takes it apart, but his proper first guard is really hard to do with your shoulder. Um, it takes a lot of effort to keep your shoulder down. It keeps a lot of effort to put that weight into your shoulder instead of trying to put the weight here. It can actually cause injuries if you do it wrong because this joint is so much weaker than your shoulder joint so his proper guard is a very straight first and it just it's very hard on the body so this was the one he starts with when he introduces guards and um i'm gonna flip to my page because it's almost impossible to read the slide because it's a little small on my screen hey look julian made it better thanks julian um, <laughs> uh, he talks about how the placement of hand, this is the first thing you do when you draw your, your sword out of the sheath. Um, and the difference is how this guard is not very safe. Uh, the sword is too withdrawn and the body remains uncovered because of, because of the high placement of the sword and the resulting distance between the forte and the body. Um, however, he also talks about um, that the head is still quite well defended by this guard, especially to the outside. So he does not just give you the disadvantages. He still tells you there are advantages to this guard. Um, and uh, if we go on to the second plate, he does talk about this. But the first thing he says, in order to do a correct first guard, it's necessary to situate the body and sword as shown in the illustration. A uh, small step, body bent, arm extended, pointed straight. Um, but he also mentions somewhere in this line that this is more fatiguing. Actually, I think he mentioned it. Hey, Letia, Letia, hold up for one second. I'm going to let some people into the waiting, uh, yeah. some waiting room in. Can I make fun of them for being late? <laughs> you can if you want to. I will. Uh, but... Yeah, let me uh, go back. So now. I thought I will if they're my friends. And if they're your friends, I'll just welcome them. All right. We're back to it. Can you see it? I can see it. Okay, good. I didn't see which people came in. So, hi, late people. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. That is your official being made fun of for being late. We welcome you, though. Um, going right along. Um, so plate two, um, and so I'm also choosing to do these. These may look a little different from the plates you're used to if you have the fabric book. This is the 1601 plates, and I chose them because they are somewhere in between the very low stances in the 1606 versions. Um, and so even though this has the straight arm, it's not as low bent, so it's a little more accessible to do. And it's kind of the in-between progress of like 
being half bet and full bet. Um, and it has the same counterbalances and the like that you find in the stance. It's just not as extreme. So it's the, the, the 1601, even though they kind of look a little less like perfectly proportionate from an artistic point of view, um, they have less of that bend. So that shows how it can vary and you don't have to be super extreme in any of these specific poses um, that there is body variation. Um, and this one shows the very long straight stance I was talking about before. Um, but you can see that's really hard on your shoulder and the temptation to use your forearm muscles to grip the sword instead of your shoulder to balance it is going to be really high and also to raise that shoulder into your ear and kind of throw your shoulder out of joint. And so there's a lot of body safety things that you have to have in place first before fully using this guard. So it's more, it would be better to start where your body can handle it without fatigue and then slowly move into more of these guards. And then there's also some mechanical differences on how you would gain and move your sword um, and Julian's going to speak a little bit of that right now. All right. Hey, thanks, Leti. I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second so I can use my beautiful face and hands. So, all right. So uh, what Leti is alluding to is, let's see, what Leti is alluding to is that um, when Fabris is talking about his extended forward um, blade because he talks separately about his blade and how he holds his body. Um, when he's talking about his blade, really the crux of why that extension is important for him is that it's covering your, your most forward target area, which if you're bent forward is your face. So he says that your forte is in front of all that. Um, and really it's a question of positioning that uh, your hardware kind of right in front of all of that. And also that it keeps your opponent at a further distance because your blade is more extended. Their point, the point is at least in theory, closer to your opponent. But this also comes at a, at a, you know, at a price, just like anything. Um, and what that price really is is the amount of distance that you cover in a uh, stepping attack either a lunge or a pass and when you're doing a lunge for a second julian um i believe maybe mark maybe your mute's not mute or mic's not muted if you could we're gonna yeah. all right he yeah, is thank you he is now muted all right so uh three components of getting distance in your lunge or your pass. The first is your arm extension. The second is your body lean. And the third is your step, whether it be with your rear foot for a pass or your forward foot for a lunge. Um, now, when you have that forward, when you are leaned forward, especially in a very, in the, in a very lean, very aggressive lean, um, you've already gotten rid of that the distance you're going to cover with that lean. And if you're extended with your arm, you also have, have you've also already covered that distance with uh, you, that's no longer part of that increased reach in the lunge or the pass. So the distance, the, the advantage that is gained as far as distance when you have that, uh, that lean forward extension is really only going to happen in the feet, which is part of why Fabris prefers the pass because the pass covers more distance in the feet. Um, with a pass versus a lunge, you get the same amount of distance covered with the extension of the arm and the body lean. It's the foot, it's the feet that are the difference. And anyway, like I said, uh, that is the price that you pay for that forward lean is that you don't cover as much distance in the execution of the pass or the lunge. And I'm going to turn this back over to Lydia. We are going to talk about third guard now, which is on plate nine of Fabris. Um, and compared to the first guard and the second guard even, 
Uh, third guard is super less laborious, even when done in the full fabric style. Um, and he, he even mentions that specifically. He says it's a less laborious guard, a more natural position. Um, but you will sacrifice, uh, and in the, in the first plate of that, and we're going to wait till the slides come up. And I'm going to get on the same page too, just to be easy on myself. Um, so this one has that bent, that bent arm that we were talking about. Um, so you do have more distance you can cover. You can, um, he talks about this being easier. Um, and that goes along with his advocation of being able to move uh, more, which goes with the, um, what Julian was saying about, you know, you do have more of that range of motion if you want to be able to extend, even though in itself, it's not as defensive a position um, it does leave more openings. Um, and he did advocate that movement is more important than smallness. Uh, so being able to move your blade, if you can't move it while it's extended, is super important. Um, but he also goes on to say, you need to be aware that one of those sacrifices you are making is not only the tempo changes, um, so you have advantage that you can create the movement, but your tempo changes and you have greater openings from this guard because through moving, you have um, a moving sword you versus the straight sword. The straight sword's already in line and therefore going to be stronger. As you move, you can take advantage of that tempo of motion to find an opening. So he talks about that there's more openings um, through both. You have to be more precise with your tempo your cavations need to be just a little bigger because you have to go around swords and it may be a disadvantage on that. But at the end, he goes on to approve of this guard because knowing your weaknesses means you can use it. Um, and not everyone knows where those openings will be. So if you're using it and you're aware of the openings, you can protect those openings. You can see when somebody's going for this or you can bait somebody into those openings um, you can do half cavations expecting that the, the opponent will go for thinking you're doing a full one and then make the attack. So those openings can be your advantage when you've got this side guard, if you're using them to work, work your opponent in a lot of ways to kind of trick your opponent into to taking advantage of what you're showing. Um, he emphasizes through that chapter uh, that the tempo needs to be correct to use this guard, but it's less fa fatiguing, uh, which does, again, make it more accessible. And especially if tempo is more your game and more the thing that you are able to see quickly than body mechanics, this might be more of a direction for you to look at Fabris because all of the methods will still work within reason, like this, where you place sword placement and whatnot uh, still works within the system. Um, we are going to go on to the plate 11, I think, the next slide with the straight arm version. So this is the straight arm version of the same guard. And we've got the nice comparison of um, the, uh, the older version and the newer version where you can see there's, there's a little bit more of an uprightness to the older version, it gives you a version, I, you can't see my mouse, my mouse is moving all over these, like you can see my mouse. Uh, but the, the older version, the colored version in this, in this case, uh, they're a little more upright, they've got less of that lean, they're not the, they're not counterbalanced in the butt quite as much. Um, so it gives a little bit more of that upright mobility um, that's not seen in the later, um, later books, which I think gives a little more flexibility in the form uh, that the having your face forward is not important. And on the face forward bit, I wanted everyone to take a note through all of these plates, your head and your front foot wind up being quite in line. You're not pushing your head so far forward that you're out of balance. 
because if you push your head so far forward that you're past your foot, um, you're actually preventing yourself from being able to move. So if you can't keep your head in line with your foot, being more upright so you can keep that alignment is more important. You should be pulling from, from your back end out to keep that balance where it is when you're upright. Your balance shouldn't change as far as where your feet are. The balance should just shift from your bum reaching it back. Your head should be in pretty much the same positioning. If we go back to the previous slide, um, you'll see they're much more upright, but their, their feet and their heads are in the same, same line and positioning. So you don't, you don't want to be so over forward. And I see a lot of people starting to do fabrics where they're, they just think if they just lean their head forward, that's what it is. But it's, it's keeping your same balance from like, if you, if you have a line in the back of your head and you're standing upright and you go from not standing upright, that line, if you line up with the back of my, my uh, closet back here, my head is staying in line. And that's what your guard should look like from standing to, to being this hunched over. So if you're standing, you still have the same balance. You still should be able to move. Um, so we are going to go on to the next couple plates. Um, so this one is more of an extended guard. And this one almost um, looks like uh, something you would find in uh, more of a Giganti um, stance. It almost looks like the front cover of Giganti, actually. Um, it's a little more hunched over to the side, but if you look at the left side of our bat, our little, yeah, that one with that reach back, that one has very similar form to Giganti. And in, when on placing the body, um, Fabris talks about having your weight mostly on a single foot and that that is a very important part of the stance. Um, and he still maintains this even for a back leaning stance. And this one, um, it still works with his theory of keeping your body um, away from your opponent. And that this one is good um, to kind of deny, uh, I've lost my plate, page. Doo, doo, doo. Sorry about that guys. There it is. Um, Um, it's a good guard for reaching your opponent. Um, it's good for withdrawing your body from him. So if you find yourself in a place um, where your opponent is attacked, you can just adopt this stance from, to prevent him from reaching you. So if he's, he's gotten in too close and you can't gain that blade, you can use that stance, still be in a guard that is easy to pull up. And, and still be that back weighted. So, but this one almost looks like a lot of the other Italian masters that you see and their primary guards. So um, we are gonna go on to the next slide. Um, this one is a lunge in third. So this one's actually after the lunge. And I just wanted to show again, um, this one is actually, I think we've got our slides one before the other again. Um, I think we, oh no, we are on the right page now. Um, sorry. Um, you'll, you'll see the, hint, this is the completed lunge. Um, and it allows you to recover quickly. It, um, you do not straighten your body to an erect posture because you are at the completion of that motion, but it's not a big mo as big of a motion from up to fully forward. Um, I think we're gonna go on to the next one so that we're balancing our time well. So next slide. Um, I wanted to show how the different masters approach the same gaining the blade of the third guard um, that is done in plate nine. 
Um, so you can see this is more the, um, we've got Capifero and Giganti's version of these same plates. And you can see that uh, Capifero is actually really similar in his lean forward for Fabris's guard, even though um, he's still got the same balance in the back. And Giganti's almost looks like that refusing stance that, Giga that Fabris was talking about uh, to defend yourself with almost a body void um, in the previous uh, one before last slide. Um, and if we go on to the next one, um, this is just reiterating the, um, the third guard, the more leaned over version, I believe. Uh, it's a little harder to see vertically. Um, but you'll see it's, it's the same, it's a straight line version of the same stances that we were looking at before. We're going to go down one more. Um, well, the first were the bent arm versions, and these are the straight line versions of, um, of our fourth or third guard. More properly formed, he says, because um, in this case, it's more just, it's even, uh, you don't have the angle and the straight line beats the angle. But again, it's harder to hold because you have to use that shoulder, even though it's easier than first and second, sure, certainly, um, it's harder to um, uh, it's harder to hold the straight line. And there are the advantages and disadvantages, which Julian talked about. And we're going to go on to our last slide, I believe, which is this crazy thing I did, where I took all of the third guards, uh, both of the proper third guard and the less proper third guard of Fabris, and I overlaid them at different opacities. And then I also took Giganti and Capifero's and I lined everybody up on this back left foot here. And as you can see, like there's different levels of like how far back their bums go and how far forward their heads are, but it's not that much of a difference of forwardness compared to that back foot. It's, it's very close to in line, it's within, you know, a few inches of how far down it is. So you can see that that balance of being related to that back foot and where you are to be able to move this top one right here, uh, you can just kind of see the, um, the like shadow of his top head there. That one's, um, that one is Giganti, which is typically a very far back push um, thing. So you would think that it would be much further back than his back foot. Um, but his third guard, when he starts talking about it, he still has that back balance. So you can see like he's almost upright. It's not that huge of a difference, which would give you, if, if you're looking at how far you have to bend, it would give you a better, like being able to move if you need to be upright, it's not that big of a difference. So you can still use all the um, methods and sword placement that Fabris talks about in these guards if you need that more upright stance because you know they all work within each other they all build on the same foundations of Italian rapier so it's easy to mix and match without having to do that hip hinge and that balance on that back foot as he's talking about put the weight on the back foot is more important than how low can you go even though you know smaller is better as we talked about. So on um, that, I think we are moving on to Julian talking a little bit more about uh, mechanics with sword and dagger and how they can affect. All right, hey everybody. Uh, I'm, I apologize for the difficult audio. Um, the, I mean, that difficult audio, the difficult video presentation. Uh, I had to go from my, uh, work computer to to uh to basically my phone but i came with an idea to make this a little bit easier for you all so i'm going to take a quick second and i'm going to make the slide deck um shareable uh and i'm going to put that link on the chat right here so you can follow along as i'm as i'm uh 
going through these slides in case you have a device that makes it a little bit harder to see. So give me one quick second real quick. All right, going to share. And while he's sharing, does anybody have any questions of my section of what I was talking about? You can come off mute for this if you have questions. All right. All right, so Letia, uh, I just made the file public. Can you post it in the chat, please, real quick? Mm -hmm. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my phone interface, but I'm going to go back to sharing the screen and jump into some where? of these. Uh, oh, you made it uh, on the drive. I shared on my drive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the uh, it's the Fabris final um, slide file, but my slides are the same even if you shared the old one, but the the new one should be public. And it's fine. So. Final. Final. Sorry. Yeah. All right. All right. So Lexi is going to put this on the uh, on the chat, and I am going to go back to sharing my screen so that you all can see what I'm talking about. All right. Great. So we're going to go back into the presentation right here. So what I'm going to be teaching is some of the plates where Fabris teaches what one would call a more conventional stance, which I'm defining as being upright and oftentimes having a, uh, a lead arm that is not extended forward in front of the face and a dagger arm that is typically uh, joined at the hilt with the rapier rather than uh, than an extended one, an extended uh, dagger like you see in many of his plates. So the first play that we see right here is his uh, is one of his um, guards that's introduced as a seconda, which is where, as most as many Italian rapiers will will know, seconda is where your uh, your knuckles or your lead edge is uh, toward your outside, toward your uh, toward your right. Um, if you're right-handed or left, if you're left-handed. Um, so I've broken down this play because he introduces it as a guard, but generally he kind of talks about it more as a play or at least a way of approaching a fight. So I'm going to just check in about the slides. I put it in the chat, so it's active right now. If anyone needs it anywhere else, please let me know. Okay. So you see the upper portion right here, which is, you can see that the guard is in seconda and the dagger is held close to the rapier. Otherwise, it's a relatively upright stance that many of you who've done Capoferro or Giganti are relatively familiar with. And then this is the strategy of how this guard is approached. And I'm using the, um, the nomenclature of, a, uh, of an agent and a patient. Uh, which you see in some treatises where the agent is really kind of the good guy and the patient is the bad guy. And the agent usually wins the exchange. So the way that this sequence works is that the agent, go, appro they're both in this guard, um, and the agent approaches into, di into distance with his opponent. However, he is not going head on. He's approaching, as you see, with the green arrow, toward the patient's right, advancing toward their dagger side. One could even interpret this as circling forward. And what they're trying to do is create two options for the patient. Either one, that patient does not respond. So if they're able to get in there to either larga or largissima, and larga is lunging measure, and largissima is passing measure, and if the patient doesn't respond, they attack to the opponent's left side beyond the dagger, exploiting whichever side of the dagger is the weakest. So they're going in toward the, toward the patient's dagger side, and they're going to be attacking in, into where their dagger is. And uh, 
you generally that's left to the left to the agent as far as how they're going to exploit that you know whether they like to go low and then go high or or high then low however the other option is that the patient does attack them and while circling to the right they are also exposing trying to invite to their uh, to their left to their dagger side and if that is going to happen what fabris advises you to do is you do not use your dagger to meet that attack. That's what the patient wants you to do. Instead, you basically execute what many people will know as uh, very familiar in Giganti and Capoferro and uh, pretty much any other rapier master. You sim that agent simply turns their wrist from seconda into quarta, which is the opposite side, and which corresponds to the side toward their dagger meets that uh, that thrust, and then uh, basically takes advantage of their blade while turning their wrist, and uh, lands a thrust home. So really simple, just turning the wrist and counter thrusting as they take advantage of the patient's blade. So it's a really simple play, and it's very familiar to it's a very kind of easy thought process uh, that should be familiar to a lot of other Italian rapier masters. However, um, I should bear to point out that that dagger is not part of the primary defense. That dagger is there in reserve to meet the, uh, the patient's blade if they uh, decide to be deceptive about it, to move into a different line. We'll go into the next play now. And this play is really similar to the, uh, to the other play. You see that the guard is also very similar. Uh, however, I will describe the difference between these two guards right now. And it's really specific to, let's see. So this one is in Terza, but the turning of the wrist really isn't that important to it. It's more that the in this play, the actor is inviting more to their to their left side they're really putting their hardware and it's hard to tell when you're looking at it from this angle but they're really parking both their sword and their dagger uh pretty far into their right side and really drawing that invitation into their left which we can see in the sequence right here all right you'll see the left side is exposed. The dagger is once again close to the rapier hilt. This is a theme that you'll see over and over and over again in Fabris's plays. And he talks about it explicitly at the beginning of his dagger chapter, where he says that you do not want your opponent to be able to get between your sword and your dagger. That's something that Fabris both does not want an opportunity for you to present, but it's also an opportunity that he exploits in some of his plays. So once again, very similar approach to this. The agent moves in, except instead of circling to his, to his right, you're really more going just having a cautious advance into measure. And the whole goal is the whole goal of this play is that you want to draw that attack into your left hand side, which was the second choice of uh, of the previous play as well you're also maybe hoping that they're going to try that the patient your opponent is going to try to reach for your blade with their dagger so that agent advances into measure slowly and carefully making sure their sword does not get found in the, in the process of all of that which is your opponent trying to actually bind or close out a line of your sword. So if the patient does take the bait and goes for your left hand side, it goes the exact same as the last play where you just, that agent just turns their wrist into quarta, meets it, gains, it, gains advantage of their opponent's blade in that action and then thrusts to them. However, uh, Fabris also says you can turn this into a gerata, which is, uh, as some of you know, it's really just a body void where um, they would turn that wrist. However, you would also step with um, 
different there are different kinds of giratas but you would step uh probably with your back leg or maybe with your front leg to the to the right away from your opponent's blade it's called a it's really just a body void where they do a body void in conjunction with that uh with that turning of the wrist however um if the patient instead of going for that attack to the agent's left side if they instead try to manhandle that uh rapier blade it's just really easy where um Fabra says that you just simply attack with with your sword while evading that reach from the dagger and this is something that um it's not gone into specifics all that much but for uh and if you're experienced with playing rapier and dagger if your opponent really reaches for your sword um with their dagger without um without controlling your sword in any kind of way that's just an easy tempo that you can take to thrust at whatever line they're exposing when reaching for it we'll go into the next play now any questions so far on the plays on the plays that we've gone over all right so this next uh, this next guard is a little bit different than the previous two. Um, the big thing here is that Fabris has the has the uh, the fencer where they're more going forward and they have their they have their arms uh, underneath their um, underneath their upper torso. You can see it right here. The idea is that their upper arm is tucked and their forearm is in line with the blade. Basically, you've got that, you're pulling your sword back uh, in an attempt for your opponent to have less control over it. So you got your upper arm tucked and your forearm's in line with the hilt and the blade. That way they can't just pick at your, uh, at your forearm. They have to get through that hilt first. And uh, just like before, the dagger is close, close to the rapier hilt. So the sequence that Fabris is going through here is once again there that agent is approaching um, is approaching to prompt an a, an action by the patient. If the so if the patient tries to uh, if the patient tries to faint around the sword, the dagger is used to defend the other line. So basically, the idea is if the if the patient is trying to like fool your sword. Um, your dagger is there to supplement, uh, to um, address whichever side of the blade, uh, whichever side of that rapier they move around. So if they, if they attack, uh, the re what he really says is the danger to this guard is that it's really safe within the, within the rapier. And it's really safe if they attack into that kind of middle area. However, if they attack for the head, um, that's where you can run into trouble. And he says that you, if you use the dagger to defend your head, um, it's likely to get deceived and they're going to, uh, and they're going to exploit it. So if that patient attacks for the head, uh, that agent, instead of following, falling for that trap, either uses the sword to address that attack, moves it up, or that, uh, the agent, um, simply just get out of there and try something else. However, what uh, Fabra says that um, this stance is good for is that he says it's good for executing feints and disengages. Um, and the specific play that he wants you to do is you can see right here that you extend the arm into secunda on the patient's outside. So to their, to the, uh, if they're right-handed, to the left of their dagger. And they draw that dagger parry to address that to address that blade. It turns into a disengage that now goes between both of those between their dagger and their sword with the uh, with the agent's blade now in quarta, which is the true edge and the knuckles facing the patient's blade. And the goal of this is that you now have your blade between both their dagger and their sword, and now they're going to get tangled up and you can thrust right on through there. And this is exactly why Fabra says to keep your dagger and your sword together, at least in the guards that where you're really by default, I should say. 
where he says to keep your sword and your dagger together by default so that your opponent doesn't do what he says you should try to do in this play, which is getting that sword between the dagger and the uh, and your opponent's sword and then getting them tangled up and thrusting on through. So we've got two more left. This is the last dagger play that he's going to talk about. And uh, you don't see that many Italian masters a lot of times where they have what uh, they have their sword down low. But in Fabris's case here, that sword is low for a very specific reason. This is a guard in Quarta. And you can see the, the hands are next to each other again. Uh, the, but in this case, the sword and the dagger have very specific roles relative to each other. That sword is meant to be a static defense down low, and the dagger is meant to defend high. And what Fabris wants you, the, uh, the agent, or you, the good guy, to do in this is you're trying to either one, Draw, you're really trying to draw them to try to reach for your sword uh, down low. And like we talked about in one, of the previous, in one of the previous plays, when your opponent tries to reach for your sword, especially when it's out of their presence or when it's um, kind of down low where they have to take a large tempo to go and reach it, that's just a big meaty opportunity for you to thrust at a, to counter thrust in a different line. So, um, Really, the ideal outcome of this of this guard is that your opponent reaches down low with their sword to to touch your sword out of maybe a sense of safety, and then you simply reach your sword on high and stab them in the face, or whichever opportunity presents itself. He also says that um, if your opponent is going for a uh, is going for a cut, all you have to do so when your opponent is throwing a cut or a mandrito from their right. A reverso is from their left. Uh, if they're throwing that mandrito from the right to your legs, all you do is you simply turn your uh, turn your wrist to meet that blade, uh, and you thrust and you thrust into their thigh. The idea being that their cut is not going to bring your blade offline enough to prevent your thrust from landing on through into their thigh. So. He also says, go ahead, uh, Letia. I was going to say, um, it is also interesting if, if you wanted to note the similarities to the, these plates with the single sword plates as well that have the low points. So if you look at the body mechanics, they're very similar. So this doesn't just relate to sword and dagger, but it also crosses into his other forms as well. It's, yeah, I'll show uh, that plate yeah. real quick. I think it's slide four. Yeah. 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 So, so you can see it right there. Anyway, actually, the slide, the slide up above that is more similar. This is well, that one has swords up, but it has more similar positioning. But both of them are similar. Was the okay. Original. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, so one thing you all might be detecting in these uh, in these discussions is that there's a lot of words. Fabris is very verbose in how he uh, how he goes through these plays, but um, but really it describes a relatively simple action and a relatively simple thought process behind um, pretty much any plate that he describes. And this is how I prefer to break them down. So the last one we're going to talk about is the uh, cloak, and you can see right here very conventional stance, something that probably most of you have seen if you've seen anyone doing cloak, at least with a heavy cloak, uh, which is what Fabris is using. Um, you've probably seen them, them take this kind of stance. Now, Fabris describes this as being a stance you take when you're tired, uh, by when you normally have you, your cloak extended, uh, you know, a big heavy cloak, um, that uh, when you have that cloak all the way out of extension is going to get tired and this is what you do um, to rest your uh, your cloak arm so you can see the hands are joined just like before you don't you still don't want your opponent to get between your hands in this case your hardware 
uh, this is in Terza, so uh, where your knuckle, your knuckle guard is straight up and down. And what you're doing, this is a, this is really just a one part decision making process. You are inviting the, uh, you are inviting the upper line above where your cloak is being held. You can see right here, these are our little players and the agent is inviting the patient to uh, do a thrust above the cloak. And then they, just like we've talked about in a couple other plays, they're just meeting that thrust in Quarta. And in that action, they are taking advantage of their opponent's blade. So they're meeting that thrust with uh, leverage on your opponent's sword and being on top of it. And then thrusting into the, the available, um, whatever's available uh, to the patient. Usually it's probably going to be in the upper body. So one thing that is very critical about this play though, is that he wants your upper arm, which has the cloak, you, he wants that upper arm to remain in place. You still want to keep your cloak hand joined with your uh, rapier hilt, but, um, but you're not presenting your opponent with an opportunity to uh, disengage into another line by moving that your whole cloak arm. Um, you're really just, moving that cloak arm just enough to uh to not present your opponent with the opportunity to get between your uh rapier and your cloak so once again you're inviting to that upper that upper line to your upper left and uh they're hopefully taking it and then you simply just turn your sword into quarta and counter thrust to wound them all right so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So what are we learning today? Um, I think we're learning a couple things. Um, one, hopefully you're getting a basic understanding about why Fabris does his lean, which Latia go, went over pretty well there. Um, and you're also learning when... <laughs> So you're also learning um, when he does not do that extension of the arm, that full extension of the arm, when he doesn't, when he does not do that forward lean, um, usually it's for a tactical benefit that is specific to that play. Um, and what the plays that I just described to you are uh, probably the majority of those plays, um, at least in book one. Book two is totally different. We're going to talk about book two later on in the luncheon series. But um, so when he talks about these guards, he's really talk, going through um, usually a simple one or two part um, decision making process where you're going in, you're trying to get your opponent to uh, take some sort of action and then you're exploiting it in some way. But it's not this extensive, this like five part decision making process where, you know, where if he does this, he does that, and if I do that, and it's it's not a really large or tall decision-making tree. It's a pretty simple one, um, but rooted in his in his principles that um, that we've gone over so far. Um, Ledia, do you have anything uh, to recap with? Um, just just to reemphasize that uh, also with the fabric lean, doing the variation that your body can do is more important than doing it wrong and not being able to move. Um, so I think that is also just important to keep in mind in addition um, to what we have already talked about. So that it's, you can do this. It's not impossible. It's not as much of a pain in the butt, even though it's a lot of butt muscles. All right. And then, uh, so um, also if, so you can be doing fibrous you can be doing perfect fabras without necessarily leaning forward, but if you want to really learn the, the whole system, and we're going to talk more about it uh, as we continue on in this class, um, learning that forward lean is probably is probably going to open up your uh, your fabras repertoire by quite a bit. Or uh, close down your guard, as the case may be. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, do we have any questions from everybody? Going once, going twice. 
All right. Uh, we will present next time uh, off mobile phone. I'm sorry if this has been kind of painful for uh, for you all whose devices aren't that familiar with mine, but uh, are aren't um, as compatible, I should say. Uh, so next time uh, I'll be presenting from my computer, hopefully in a little bit more of a uh, of a um, compatible format where you can see everything that's being presented without me having to zoom in back and forth. But uh, as always, you can hit us up uh, anytime off of the uh, off of this presentation. I'm going to be putting this up on YouTube uh, if it doesn't look like ass, but I probably will anyway. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Hope you all have a great Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.